Brilliant. Okay, thank you for joining. This is going to be hopefully a little, um, quite a rapid whistle stop tour around interactive fiction. Um, I'm aware that we've got some non technical and some technical people in the room. So, obviously, uh, designing educational content to hit all of those targets is sometimes tricky. So, um, the way it's going to work is the first half of this is going to be me excitedly waxing lyrical about interactive fiction. We're going to have lots of examples and case studies and that sort of thing. And I really want to just dig into what makes interactive fiction tick and what really makes it sing over other media. Um, I say this a lot, but I've been misquoted as saying that interactive fiction is a better way of telling stories than linear media. It's not. It's just a different way. And I really want to sort of dig into why it's different and what makes it really sing. Um, and we'll talk about the different types of interactive fiction, why they're cool, and then a little um, closer look at some examples of the stuff that we're going to try and make together. Um, the second half, we're going to ignore my voice and slides, and we're going to get straight into some code. So today, we're going to focus on Twine, which some of you might have heard of. Um, you might have encountered it and not realized. Um, Twine is an amazing open source, cross-platform, free technology that lets you write interactive fiction really, really quickly and has really democratized the space. And you don't need to be a um, college-educated, straight, white male in order to produce video games anymore. You can be anybody with an internet connection and you can suddenly make games that tell your story. Um, and for me, um, Twine is a perfect example of why it's important to throw tools open to as wide a spectrum of people as possible, because amazing people are making amazing work in it. And hopefully you guys might as well. That's the plan. Um, but for now, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a load of slides. Um, all the way through this, um, please do interrupt if you've got questions, comments, or anything. Or you can hit the chat if you're more of a text type of person. That's completely fine. Um, so yeah, please do interrupt. Treat this as like a as a classroom session, like I'm here to be kind of um, stopped and offer additional information, but I will try and go as quick as I can. And um, when we get to the coding part as well, and for this, I suppose, at the end of this session, I'm going to send out an absolute mountain of resources, including the slides and the notes. So don't worry about taking notes on any of this stuff. All the slides and everything that I've written will be available to you immediately. So you can look back at it, back at it as reference. Um, when it's a classroom, it's easier to kind of code along and follow along when somebody's separate, but obviously with you, with Zoom, and your own stuff gets a bit difficult on Zoom. So um, yeah, try to, this, this is more of a relaxed session though, that you can refer back to later if you want to deep dive on some of the stuff I'm going to teach you. With that being said, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if this works. And I'm going to hit the button. Can everybody see that? Great, thumbs up, I'll take it. Hello. Um, so we're going to talk about IF. And the first thing I'm going to do actually is ask you the question, though. I'd like you guys to respond to me. Um, what is it that that you define interactive fiction as? Can anybody just give me a quick um, burst of what they what they assume I mean by interactive fiction? Uh, goosebumps. Does anybody goosebumps. remember the Goosebumps books? Good example. They, so, um, so, so what, what was so were they like kind of lightly interactive? Yeah, barely. You know, you get to the end of the chapter and you could choose where you went next. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, anybody else? Give me something like... On the spot here. It could be something like Dungeons and Dragons, kind of uh, uh, create, was it create your own... Choose your own adventure. Choose your own adventure. That's the phrase. Okay, so we're, so we're talking about interaction. We're talking about kind of choices and agency and that sort of thing. Brilliant. So my definition is really, and it's a very kind of malleable thing, um, it's storytelling where the player has some agency is the phrase that I kind of like, where you're, we're talking about players rather than readers. Um, potentially, we will talk about narrative with multiple routes or endpoints. So choose your own adventure is a brilliant example. And we're going to talk about that in a bit more in depth later. Um, and it's like, you can be quite abstract about this as well. And it's simply stories where things change. Um, and sometimes when we talk about interactive fiction, it can be all of these things, and sometimes it's none of them. There are more experimental and more weird sort of types of interactive fiction that change in more subtle ways than taking you through door A or door B. That's cool. So it is a very, very varied um, field, and I'll show you a couple of examples of different things. Um, there are three, like, two, well, two main types, really, of interactive fiction. And just for completeness, I wanted to show you the first type that um, I think uh, learners of a certain vintage or age uh, will have potentially played some of these. Um, I grew up playing these. Um, so these are part what, I, what we tend to call parser style um, interactive fiction, which is where you are typing sentences and words into the story and the story understands what you're, what you're trying to do and then we'll play out the story, you know? So you've got a command prompt. So games like Trinity, Mind Forever Origin, there's tons and tons of these. Um, there was kind of a, 
a 10 year golden age of these games. Um, the more famous one that you might have heard of, um, even if you've not played it, is Zork, of course. And the interface was text based, and you will be given a little fragment of story and then a prompt. And at that point, you can type in something that you would like to do, and the story will progress. Okay. So, for example, open mailbox, it will understand there'll be a leaflet inside. Now, this is fine. Um, so, the flow will go, the game will say there is a small mailbox here, and you will type something like open mailbox. And then the game has been programmed to understand that most players will want to interact with the mailbox in some way. So you couldn't type something like, I don't know, eat a banana, because there's no real context for that. And the game will go, I don't understand. But what the designer of the game knows is that you're going to, it's very, very likely the only interaction you're going to have with a mailbox is to open it. And so part of writing these is kind of figuring out what the player wants to do. And again, we can follow it, open in the mailbox, release the leaf, re reveals the leaflet, take the leaflet, yada, 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 yada. And the flow is quite quite straightforward. Uh, works beautifully in text. Now, one of the problems with this kind of um, uh, this kind of interactive fiction is that if the person who's written it doesn't anticipate what the player is going to say, even if it just means they've used the wrong word, the game doesn't understand quite what they mean. And that's a classic kind of problem with this sort of interactive fiction, particularly among hobbyists who will expect a very exact phrase. But uh, the problem is with English is you can say the same thing in a thousand different ways, right? So it might be that you want to pick up the leaflet. The game doesn't understand that because the coder has put it wrong. Grab the leaflet. I don't understand that either. Take the leaflet, you pick up the leaflet. And so you end up with these kinds of scenarios where the syntax of, of Eng the English language becomes like a real difficult kind of hurdle. And that's what I tend to avoid this sort of stuff because you get very, very quickly sort of um, embroiled in this, this kind of thing. Um, and then you end up with situations. So this, I forget what the game is, um, but this was a very, very specific scenario where there was a trigger in the bottom of a plant pot. And unless you plant the pot plant in the plant pot, and you type that exact phrase, the game wouldn't understand what you did. And you, you end up with these really, really sort of esoteric sentences and things. Um, when they're written well, though, just to clarify, they are fantastic. And I'll, I'm going to include a couple of really good examples of um, experiences and games that you can play that have been coded in a really fun. So it's part, partly a writing exercise. The person understands what the player is likely to try and do. And then partly a technical exercise in terms of, oh, well, the player has expressed that slightly differently, but you know, I've coded it to understand what they mean. Okay. Now, I just wanted to show you those because they're part of the kind of interactive fiction sphere, but this isn't the type we're going to talk about. The type we're going to talk about is um, one of the ones that's probably more recognizable to you. So your responses um, to the question at the start around choose your own adventure, the goosebump books, that kind of thing, um, come under what I call branching path narrative. Um, and in fact, we've, we talk about choose your own adventure quite a lot in, um, in these workshops because they are often many people's first or only experience with interactive fiction and certainly were things that I interacted with years and years and years ago. Um, they cover amazing topics as well. So you're in space, you're inside a UFO, you're on the throne of Zeus, and then one in the top corner, you're going to die, which I quite like. Now, just as a random X, X like kind of a, a just a single page from a single unrelated story, I'm not gonna, I don't know what the story is, but I quite like this idea that you'll be in a scenario on a given page. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what the context of the story is, but I love that the options are try and escape hitch a ride on the whale, or I don't know. And all three of those scenarios are handled by the author of the project, which I think is great. Um, and so the structure is essentially, um, I'm on a particular page, I've read a particular bit of the story, and it's now down to me as a player slash reader to make the right decision. And these stories got more and more complex as time went on. So initially, we were just having branching paths. But later ones, um, I think the Choose Your Own Adventure ones did. And there was a, a nightmare series where at the start, you would choose things like a character class or you would choose an item to hold. And the game book would say, uh, rather than saying, what do you want to do? It would say, if you're holding a sword, you can go to this page. Or if, you, if you're a magician, you can do this, yada, yada. So there were different ways in which even just a completely analog version of interactive fiction works. And I, I love, really, really love this stuff because the way the digital versions of this stuff works is exactly identical. And this was kind of the precursor to that stuff. Um, those of you who grew up in the UK um, might remember Nightmare. Um, so again, it was sort of, you have, would have teams guiding a single individual through um, a maze. They were issuing, uh, making choices and issuing commands to a blindfolded player to get them through. And they would have to continually make different choices in order to solve puzzles, talk to people, choose the right door, all of that stuff. And so, 
part of this was about mapping the same kind of branching storyline where everything had been pre-written, everything existed, but it was down to the players to work together to decide where the story was going to go. And that's why this kind of TV show translated perfectly into printed medium and video games as well. Um, more recently, um, you guys might have played uh, Bandersnatch, which was the interactive Black Mirror. Um, if you haven't, I suggest checking it out just because there's nothing else like it. It's a little violent, but it's fantastic and it's quite meta. It follows the story of a kid making video games and going completely loopy and murdering everybody in his path. Um, but Netflix put it out as a, as a, a binary choice system. So you will see a little bit of the program and it's produced to the same um, kind of level as proper TV programs. And then you'll reach a pausing point where you need to decide what's gonna happen in the story. And um, this thing was actually planned out in Twine as well, which is fantastic. So not only did the producers of that non-linear TV show use Twine, um, Twine is also shown in the show. So because it's about people making video games, um, one of the people in the show is using Twine, which I thought was quite nice. But this is an actual screenshot of um, the Twine layout for the show and you can see that the linear the narrative doesn't go from a to b it goes all over the place and back again which is quite cool and it's got things like loops in it so if you get stuck on the wrong thing you can keep choosing the same thing until you realize you're in a loop and you can do it does really clever stuff simply by giving the choice between a and b so although we talk about branching narrative as being a binary choice sometimes you'll have four five six choices or there'll be different choice that random randomness or you know all sorts of things ultimately what we're talking about is non-linearity so multiple pathways through a narrative potentially multiple endings um, and there are other ways that um, other forms of interactive fiction that don't fall into those two sort of main categories um, there are games like her story which is a kind of non-linear um, investigation into a murder where all of the, um, the scenes are actually interview videos. And as you learn new words and new names, you can type them in as search terms and uncover new videos. Now, what's interesting about this kind of story is the whole thing plays out non-linearly. So you never get to an end point. You just draw your own conclusions from the story once you know enough. And it doesn't, you can watch them all if you, if you search correctly, but you're never told exactly what happens. And it's down to you to kind of um, draw your conclusions. And the way in which you move through the story and the things that you learn may give you a different impression. And so everybody, every player's experience of this story is a little bit different, which I really like. And it's a, a genuinely cutting edge piece of narrative. Um, there are games like Orwell, where you're tasked with, um, so this is slightly more interface driven, so there is a deep story with lots of characters and you're investigating, um, I think it's um, uh, an act of um, terrorism in the future in a, a marketplace and an assassination, and you're tasked, you're kind of a more official person tasked with uncovering who did it and their motivations and that sort of thing. And so quite often you will have a very, very sprawling piece of non-linear interactive fiction that plays out through things like interfaces and that sort of thing. And so you still do get the story, but the way it's fed and structured to you is still quite non-linear and quite interesting. Um, and then you get games that I quite like, um, like uh, Bury Me, My Love, which is a mobile game first. I think it's on Switch and stuff as well. And this is an entirely dialogue driven piece of interactive fiction where you play the husband of a refugee trying to make it to the West from Syria. And it plays out in real time, which is amazing. So you will give her advice or ideas or help her decide what to do, whether to bribe the people smuggler or go, go her own way, what to take, what to put in a bag. And um, she will disappear for a few days. She'll make a choice or you will make a choice and she will disappear. And then a couple of, couple of days later, potentially, your actual phone will beep and the story will continue. And so you, they use kind of chronology as part of the dramatic kind of um, telling of this story which i think is absolutely mind-blowing to me it's a brilliant piece of work which i highly recommend you check out um, and a lot of this is filtered into my work as well so i've just finished a project called close hands um, which was a 130,000 word um, piece of interactive fiction uh, with five characters and about 250 scenes or something um, that all kind of spiral in and out of each other and is played non-linearly um, the actual content is very very text-based and again you can see here we give a binary choice at the end and so this is almost like an interactive novel. It's a very, very deep kind of complex piece of, of text really. Um, but it does have quite a traditional structure in terms of what you choose and what you do. Um, I've also got in this game, a lot of visual interfaces, but again, these are actually still binary choices. So you can see we've got fake instant messenger things here. Um, we still give the player binary choices, even though they can explore and do different things. Ultimately, it's quite a linear piece of fiction with big decision points that will give you different endings and that sort of thing. Um, so what is it exactly that makes interactive fiction properly unique? Like mechanically, like storytelling wise, um, what is it that makes this stuff sing? And for me, I think there are two elements to this, agency and perspective. And I'm just gonna quickly outline why I've split this down. So the first is agency. Um, so we've talked a little bit about um, potentially 
re-describing um, your readers as players. They are no longer just on rails going through a piece of linear fiction. They, are, they have agency in the story and it's really, really important. So ultimately, this is what we're talking about. The, the single biggest core building block of a piece of interactive fiction is simply something needs to be done. Which do you choose? Go left, go right, you know, whether that's metaphorical or not, okay? Um, but obviously this can be expressed in, in better ways. And it's far more interesting when your interactive fiction allows not just tiny binary choices where it's like, oh, I wanna do one of two things, but I'm gonna end up in the same place. The power of interactive fiction is um, in scenarios like this. I'm just gonna, I've got your, all of your faces are over the top of my thing. Whatever. Um, so we've got four possible answers to this. So with a mighty crash, the Ragnar the terrifying kicks through the door, yada, yada, yada. What do you do? And I love that interactive fiction doesn't need to just go to two similar but different places. We can go completely wild. And you've got an option to kind of um, tell a broad story as well as a deep one. So the difference be, I mean, imagine in this hypothetical story, you've got four branches here. Each of the four branches will lead you into four completely different directions. So the standard thing, I'm going to draw my sword and fight. I might be the kind of player slash reader that just wants to go through an aggressive version of this game. Um, I might do, oh, hello. I might jump out of the window. I might be a conflict diverse player and suddenly my story is going to take on a completely different flavor i might cast an invisibility spell i might be the kind of player that wants to do something a bit more strategic or it might be that i'm the kind of player i it might be this story is actually quite humorous in the same way that broken sword will do stuff like this you'll occasionally get humorous answers that will get you into trouble then each of them will give a different flavor to how the scene plays out and each of them will do four completely different things from the same starting point and spiral out into four completely different scenarios which i think is completely amazing um, and really, the point is that when you give them agency, your readers become players. This isn't about you going, oh, I've written this thing, and now you're going you're gonna to read it in the order that I wrote it. I like the idea of going, okay, I've written many things, and you're going to experience some of them potentially in the wrong order. And your story and your reading of this story will take on a different meaning depending on what you've chosen. And I think there's quite a lot of power in that. <laughs> so you can express these things quite simply, like a lot of interactive fiction and a lot of video games, even big, expensive AAA video games, ultimately boil down to, is this a good decision or a bad decision? That's fine. You can be more nuanced than that, but it's a very, very common pattern is, um, or is am I gonna do a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you can be, the gray areas are more interesting to me. So moral choices and play styles um, are very, very flexible with this kind of medium. Um, I also like closer looks. And I'm gonna talk about projects at the very end of this where I'm adapting a real text into interactive fiction, uh, in, well, interactive nonfiction, I suppose. Um, where instead of adding or fictionalizing new approaches, we're using the medium to allow people to look closer and ask questions and dig deeper into a story. And that's always completely an option. Um, and yeah, and just taking unique pathways through a story is, is something very powerful. So the idea that if you play something like her story, it's statistically likely that your, um, your pathway will not be the same as the next person's pathway and your reading of the story might be different. And the idea that you can win or lose it, you know, uh, the, the good ending or bad ending becomes, um, malleable and changeable when you're doing interactive fiction, which I think is incredible. So the more important thing I think is perspective. And this is something that I find when it's explained to you, you realize, but it, it took me a little while to understand the power of what this means. And so um, anyone who's studied English at any level <laughs> will know this, but it's worth just talking about again, because interactive fiction does something that until it's made clear, isn't clear. So a first person perspective um, is something that you'll definitely have come across. And this is also used in video games when we're talking about literal perspectives, but a written perspective would include something like, I continued talking down, down Zoom, hoping the audience understood what I was waffling rapidly about. They looked confused. I tried to salvage things by making a cheap meta gag about them in the slide content. So this is me telling the story. I am talking about my experience and I'm broadcasting it to you, the audience, okay? There's nobody else involved in this transaction. The third person perspective is the one that you'll know if you're like most novels are written in some in first, most in third. Um, and the reason is that what the third person perspective does is add a camera pointing at the person, pointing at the subject, and it allows extra expression other than, oh, this is what I did, this is what I felt. So the clever and handsome workshop leader continues speaking, sharing, sharing his profound wisdom on how to write interactive fiction. At least that's what he hoped it looked like it was going terribly. So what we've got now is an invisible narrator who is able to describe things other than with the words that are coming out of my mouth, okay? Hence, clever and handsome, it's not my words. Um, and so this is a really, really powerful way of expressing things really deeply because you've got that virtual cameraman, whether it's a written piece of fiction or a quite literal a camera um, in the case of video games, that sort of thing. Now, those two work for very good reasons. 
Now, the second person is something that you don't really consider. Like, what is the second person narrative? Well, the second person narrative is almost like taking the camera and turning it around and pointing it back at the reader. And the reason that, so for that reason, it doesn't really work in cinema and it doesn't really work in normal text because what we're doing is we're placing the emphasis on the reader. You're almost forcing the decisions onto the reader. So second person perspective says, you suddenly find yourself standing in front of a workshop audience. This isn't how it's supposed to go. You have to make the decisions now. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Now, I, th I think there are experimental novels that are written in the second person, but I think that would be exhausting to read because you are the, like, the, you're almost kind of forcing um, action onto someone by doing this. It's like I, as a writer, am telling you what you are feeling and experiencing. And it may be only, it's one of those things that only makes sense in interactive fiction because without the agency, it, 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 it merges really well with agency basically for me. And so having a novel written in second person is horrible, but having a game doing that saying, okay, I am placing you into the shoes of this character. This is you now, this is your experience choose your own adventure, you know, this stuff works. And until somebody explained this to me, I went, oh, I'd never considered a second person, but actually it is the perfect fit for interactive fiction. It's quite interesting. Is that making sense for everybody? I, I appreciate I'm talking extremely quickly. <laughs> yeah, a, a comment though. Um, yes, fire away. Yes. Um, you know, that the, the second person also appears um, uh, in pornography. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, there is POV porn. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good point. Okay, so I think what we can maybe do is re-clarify the idea that it's still a niche, a niche viewpoint that has particular use yes. cases that aren't very widespread. That's, that's my diplomatic re reading. <laughs> that's a really good point. And VR is a really interesting one. So like, um, you, like uh, and, and video games in general. So we, we talk about first-person shooters where the camera is pointing out of your eyes, third person video games where you can see yourself. And then second person, again, doesn't quite exist in games. And, and yeah, VR is quite interesting with that stuff. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's about where this stuff makes sense. And second person just, just makes, it just gels very well with what we're talking about here. So yeah, it is powerful. And the reason is that um, you're able to kind of, when you tell stories, there is a, a resonance that you kind of dial up when you describe something beautifully. And, and you, know, you know, when you read a novel and even if it's set in third person, when it's described beautifully and the prose is fantastic and you're sucked into this thing, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. A second person kind of is a more clumsy way of doing it. And, and it's a way of you really pushing someone quite directly into the shoes of a character. And you, what you're doing is you're almost having to force the player into assessing what they would do or think or feel or decide in a particular uh, scenario or scene. Um, and, it is, and it's kind of, it's a weird thing to write as well. So we are gonna do some as well. And you kind of almost have to, sh everything you've learned about writing, you kind of have to shift because you're turning the camera around and telling the player what to do. And it, but it is an exciting thing to do. So we're gonna try some. So um, where exactly do you see this stuff outside of, you know, we talked about interactive fiction video games, um, but this sort of stuff exists all over the place. You know, the idea of branching narratives, um, different decisions ending up in different places, characters that are aware of what you're choosing and potentially your choices affecting future scenes, that sort of thing. You see it everywhere. So even in really big AAA games, and this is a bugbear that I have intensely as, a, as an interactive writer, is that you'll play a game like this, which is Horizon Zero Dawn, that costs tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of billions, of like shitloads of money to make. And ultimately, a lot of the writing is still branching narrative and it will say, hmm, I did a thing, and then four canned answers. And for me, I just feel like, and I, I, I will say this until I, <laughs> until I die of old age and crumble into dust, I feel like it's a missed opportunity. You can do amazing things with narrative and people are doing, but for some reason, the mainstream AAA space is absolutely terrified of doing anything remotely clever or anything um, slightly subtle or nuanced. And so you end up with scenarios like this very, very often. Like this has got like really clever characters, beautiful rendered scenery and everything. Ultimately, still a text game, isn't it? Really, <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? Like these scenes are still text, okay? But you do see them everywhere and you can design and branch these things um, yourself using the tools that I'm gonna teach you. And very often tools like Twine are used by huge studios because they're a really good way of, de of designing branching conversations. You know, like if you're in Microsoft Word, for example, and you're trying to design a scene like this where the conversation can go in four different ways. And then each of those four different ways could go in four different ways and so on and so on a few levels of that and you suddenly got hundreds and hundreds of scenes 
And so writing it in a, a document that goes from top to bottom is a very difficult thing to do and it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Whereas if you use something like Twine that, that allows you to branch and allows you to sort of map where things go, conceptually it suddenly makes sense. And it means that you can try out all of your conversations and your scenes and your flow and everything else before it touches your million billion dollar rendering engine. Um, but I do think these companies should be doing cleverer stuff than just branching narratives. What do I know? Um, people do it for entire games. Um, you will, you'll see games, I mean, I do it quite often. I will sketch out the entire flow of a video game just using interactive fiction engines. Um, I won't write any of the pros, but I will go, oh, here's where a scene is, here's where a scene is. If the player chooses this door, they'll go. You can literally make maps in Twine that have no text in if you just want to know the layout of a space and we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, uh, it also works really well. So I know people who will do things like figure out RPG systems and, and numbers and stuff in, in engines like Twine because they're really accessible and really easy to use and they're free and they, they just work everywhere. And so why would somebody spin up new code and new tools when you've got a tool off the shelf like Twine that will let you do this sort of thing? What's an RPG? Oh, far away. Sorry, I didn't hear that. What's an RPG? Oh, sorry. What's an RPG? A role-playing game. So, um, but, but I guess what I was getting out there was any game that's got suitably complex systems that you, you might map out on paper and get snarled up in. Um, you've got a way of suddenly making a system that will go, oh, if I've got 300 hit points or whatever, this might happen. Or if a character likes me enough, they may offer me this dialogue choice. So you can prototype systems that aren't necessarily just text games. You can do a lot with this stuff. Okay. And um, more interestingly to me, so I still do a lot of stuff in the digital arts and we've now got things like interactive theater, which I say now, like it's just been inventive, but um, so interactive um, theater shows where you've got audience participation. Um, I think people like Punch Drunk have been doing this for years. There are a lot of people, even at small scales, making theater shows or um, interactive works or participatory works where the performers don't know which way it's gonna go and the audience can change it and it might change every night. And again, because you've got that non-linearity, map it out in Twine. You can make a prototype that works very well in text. And if you know what the possibility space is in text, you can then start hanging things onto it using different media. So again, looking at Bandersnatch, telly is very expensive to make, but knowing where your story is and what the scenes are, you can do it first in Twine or whatever your tool of choice is and suddenly you're able to make this thing, even though the scenes don't fit together in a particular order, you know what you need to make and you know what connects to what, okay? So it's all about non-linearity for me. Um, and then, like I say, I'm also working on um, a novel and an adaptation, both of which are very, very influenced by interactive fiction. Um, so I'm adapting this at the moment, which is a, a true life Holocaust account that I've been asked to try and bring to new audiences without adding any fiction. But what we are doing is we're adding a ton of research that will let players look in more detail um, and uh, look around and converse a bit more. So we're adding just enough of a flavor to go, okay, well, actually an audience playing this may be able to look for not, I was gonna say clues then, that's not right, but look for additional context, additional information, additional descriptions based on more things that we're bringing to this true life account. So often when we talk about interactive fiction, what we are really talking about is a system that doesn't just let you tell stories, but it lets you tell broader or deeper stories as well. You know. Uh, um, a dungeon crawling game where you can win or lose and kill lots of monsters and end up in lots of different places, I would say is a very broad story. Whereas sometimes what you're going to tell is a very deep story. So for example, this thing is going to be deeper or the um, Bury Me My Love, that example that I showed you before, there are very few endpoints, but what you can do is there are many, many optional things you can add to it. And the more you play it, the deeper the experience goes. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, it's all that kind of making sense to everybody. I appreciate that was a whistle stop, um, breakneck intro to interactive fiction. Um, brilliant. So um, I'm more of a doer than a waffler. So I think I would like to just get stuck into writing some, if that's okay with you guys. Um, just bear with me a moment. I'm going to flip to Twine. Right. So um, just before we start this part, um, there are two ways of doing this for people. I appreciate that watching a Zoom and then also coding along to a Zoom is quite difficult. I know some people are on laptops and you're gonna be alt tabbing and whatever. So if you would like to code along, if, like, if you're technically savvy or whatever, or you're, you, you feel that you can keep up or you can see both windows, then do feel free to code along. We're not gonna make anything particularly complicated and it's more about me explaining how this stuff works. 
Um, we are one of the reasons we're recording this is that this video will then be your reference if you want to just listen and absorb it and then try it later. Um, what I'm also going to do is I'm going to send out the code. It's just a few lines of bits and bobs, and I'm going to send out a load of references. So if you want to just watch and then try it later, you'll have all the bits you need. Um, the feedback when I've run this kind of course before is that on planet Zoom, it's very difficult to You've got, kind of got eyes pointing in both directions and it's quite tricky. Um, so yeah, don't worry if you're not following along. Um, we're going to get stuck in anyway. Um, brilliant, right. So for those of you who do want to try and follow along, um, I'm going to hit share again. So we're going to use Twine as mentioned. Um, now Twine is amazing. It's brilliant and I love it. Um, Twine is an open source cross-platform um, interactive fiction engine. It's really, really prevalent. It's been massively widely adopted um, over the last few years since it came out. And then I think there's a few reasons for this. The first is that it's free. Free is good. We like free. Um, it's open and source and people extend it and mess with it. I've got a version that I customized as a prototype version for closed hands, for example, and I couldn't have done that if it wasn't open source. Um, the idea that it works in a browser, there is a Twine app as well, but the app is just a windowed version of the browser and the browser version is absolutely fine. Um, the other thing that I really like about it is it uses, it spits its stories out in um, standard web stuff. It's not a clever binary. It's not an installable game. There's no rubbish. It just spits out open web tech. So you can play it anywhere, you give it to anybody, you can stick it on the internet and everybody can play it. And so all of these things put together mean that software like Twine has really democratized the making of interactive fiction. And this is true of lots of open source and kind of accessible engines. Um, I think that video games were worse when you needed a computer science degree and an expensive computer and four years to make it. And now we have tools like Twine where if you have an idea and you want to express it, even if it's a tiny, tiny micro game that will take someone 10 minutes to play, you can do it now in Twine, it will cost you nothing and you can give it to everybody. And I think that is amazing. And it's, it's something you kind of take for granted, but it is incredible. So Twine is great because it does this one thing well, it makes branching stories really, really effectively. So for the purposes of today, I want to show you how to make the simplest possible dungeon crawler ever. Now, now we're going to use we're going to make a dungeon game because that's my default touch point for games but remember you can make these games about anything and i've made games that are completely dialogue based people make games about their experiences their relationships their pets anything you can imagine if you can write it you can play it right and twine is great for this so for those of you following along you need to go to twinery.org and you will land on a page like this and I don't think they make a big enough deal of this tiny button here that says use it online. This should be massive and flashing with a big arrow pointing to it because the fact that this just works in your browser is amazing to me and it's full featured. Um, and it says, oh, you can download it for Windows and Mac, but it looks exactly the same, it functions identically. I prefer the web version because it's bang up to date and it's, it's completely stable and works brilliantly and I do all my work in it. We're gonna hit the magic button. Um, it stores your games in, um, in your browser's kind of cache and you can export them and save them. So if you're kind of conscious that you've been writing something that you wanna save, you can export it and it dumps it out and then you can import it later on. So if you stick it in Dropbox or whatever your backup method of choice is, you can do that as well. Um, but yeah, if you don't do that, it'll still retain them. But obviously if you move to a different browser, they will disappear. So make sure that you've got a kind of, if you're very precious about the things that you make, make sure you're backing them up. So what we're gonna do is, and I just wanted to draw your attention to this screen. Oh, oh no, it's got dark mode as well. Everybody loves dark mode, right? Oh yeah. Um, so one thing that is cool is that you get like a little map. So you can see that this is a, a little test that I had here that's got loads and loads of nodes. And I'll just show you the interface. So this is a story, I think this was part of a prototype from a while ago. So the things that you're gonna use are, there's some three buttons here that will let you zoom in and out. So at different zoom levels, so you can, you can mouse around different zoom levels. So very, very tiny just gives you an idea of the structure and what joins to what. If you zoom in a little bit more, you get the names. So each of your scenes or each of your blocks has a name. And this is important because you need to tell what links to what. And then you can zoom in loads and you get like the first couple of lines of text of each one. So you can kind of see my writing in each of these scenes. I find this a, a bit much, um, but yeah. And then the other thing that you'll need to know is this play button. There's a big green button here called passage that makes a new block we'll never use it and I'll show you why. It, I, I've never clicked it in my life and you won't need to because when we type stuff, it will make new blocks for us. Um, and then the other thing that we've got is, so you can drag things around and you can mess around with stuff. And as you can see, things join together and they stay joined together. Now Twine is cool because you've got chance to use the, so this is just a text game. 
and where the things are is just for you in this view. So when I play this, it gives me the text game and I can read it and then press a button and I can carry on reading it. Okay, so this was like me writing a lot as a prototype for the game. And you can see that I've got multiple options. And every time I press one of these, it goes to one of the new blocks that it links to. Okay, so if I close this again, you can see I'm just going from block to block to block and each one has got text in it. Now, what's cool about Twine is that the layout is completely arbitrary. And so whether this is there or it's over there, it doesn't matter. This is for your use as a writer. So it might be that, for example, you all of the bad decisions that a character can make might go down the left side and all of the good decisions go down the right hand side. Or it might be that, for example, you're making an adventure game and it might be that your blocks are laid out as, as a map. You know, if you've got a block and you set, you're saying to your player, there is a door to the, to the left, a door to the west and a door to the east. It might be that the blocks they link to are physically in that location. And as you're writing, you build a map of the dungeon that you're building. Or it might be that your blocks are all over the place and there's no order. Um, and I'm not judging you at all, but you can tell a lot about a person by the layout of their Twine story and desktop, but mainly Twine story. So that's how it works. Um, each of these is a, just a, a single clickable item. You can double click it and then you can write into here. Now there's loads and loads of buttons for editing and, and styles and things. We're not gonna touch a single one of them. We're just gonna talk about text and joining things together. Because it's all web-based, you can change anything you can change in a web page in terms of colors, layout, behavior, whatever you can do here. Today, we're just gonna talk about the text. I'm just interested in what stuff does, okay? So as you're typing, um, you can then close it and it all saves because it's in a browser. You don't have to hit save. Everything you type is just retained. Okay, so rather than this complicated version, we're going to go back home and start a new project and we'll do a, go through it from scratch. So if you hit this home button here, oh yeah, uh, you've also got some extra um, options. You've got a little arrow button here. Um, you can edit things like the JavaScript and the style sheet. So this is where, if you know what you're doing, you can change the look and the behavior of your pages. So although we're working in plain text today, you can mess with it. Um, there's a button here called change story format. There's different languages in Twine, but we're just going to use the default one. It's called Harlow, I think. Um, there are different reasons that different people will, will use different languages. The structure is always the same in terms of how it works, but there is one language, for example, that's a little bit closer to code. Um, and there are some languages that work with other languages, that kind of thing. Um, but the default one is very well documented and it's very easy to use. We like those, those things. Um, rename story, um, you can snap to grid if you're an organized type, that kind of thing. Um, and then this one's really handy as well. View proofing copy will open the entire story as, a doc as just a plain text document. And this is where obviously you could print it out, mark it up, edit it, that kind of thing. Okay, so it doesn't do anything, but you can read all the text and print it out, which I do quite a lot. So if you hit the home button, you'll go back to the story menu and you can make as many stories as you like. Each of these is completely distinct and they don't know about each other. So they're kind of like silos of content. You can make as many as you like. Quite obviously, we've got a add story button. So we're gonna do this from the start and I'm gonna call it. So I think we'll, we'll, make, a, we'll make a dungeon crawler because that feels like the default thing you would do as an interactive story, right? But please do be as weird as possible when you try this stuff out yourselves. Um, I'm sticking with that because we just understand the format of going through doors and picking stuff up, okay? And I'm gonna call it my, I don't know, cool adventure. It won't be a cool adventure. It's gonna be a very simple adventure, that's okay. So when you start a new story, we get a single scene because um, it's the same as programming. For those of you who code computers, you have an entry point to your program, and which is how the computer knows where to start your story. Although your stories can be non-linear and fire all over the place, you gotta start somewhere. And that little green rocket icon means this is your starting scene. Once you start writing, you can change which of your scenes is the starting scene. You can right click it and make it the default one. So that's where your program will begin. If it doesn't lead anywhere, like at the moment, um, there's nothing in here. So if I hit play, we will get, um, so when you're in the browser, when you hit play, it opens up another tab and plays your story. And then you can close that tab and you go back to Twine, if that makes sense. So if I double click this, the default, if you ever see the phrase, double click this passage to edit it, that, is, that means nothing is here, okay? So what we're gonna do is, um, we need to write something that's gonna tell the player, this is scene one, okay? We need to tell the player what the hell is going on. Where are we? What's going on? This is a dungeon. So we're going to start them off in a dungeon room. So we will double click. The first thing I'm going to do is you can see this is called Untitled Passage. Now the title of these boxes is very important because the title is what we use to link boxes together. Obviously interactive fiction is predicated on moving around. And so we need to have a system in place for moving around. Um, I by convention, this isn't a rule, you can call it Dave if you want, I'm not bothered. Um, I tend to call things, uh, call my, my start story start, and I use camel case because I'm a 
programming doc. Um, and I'm going to say something like, and please do follow along if you'd like. Um, we're going to type in second person because we're making a game for other people to play. So I'm not going to say I am in this room. We're going to say you are in a dungeon room. Whoa. Okay. And so I've written a bit of text. And the flow basically is at any point, I can either click outside of this box or I can hit the X. And you can see that it's updated. And just for completeness, we'll hit play. You're in a dungeon room. Whoa. Nothing happens because we haven't given the player anything to click. Okay. So the next, one, next thing we're going to do is we're going to give them. Um, oh, yeah. And so um, you can drag this around. I'm such a stickler for grids. I love a grid. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, I mean, ultimately, the two big pieces of construction um, kind of tooling that you need for an interactive story are mm. linking to things. And I would say also state. And by state, what I mean is um, variables for programmers. So this is um, stuff that can change that might alter the story. So if you can't do any of that and you're just going from block to block, you're just choosing things, you can write a perfectly good interactive story. So this would just be, oh, I'm in a particular scene. I'm going to choose a left door or a right door. And in the right door, it might be there's a monster and you can fight the monster or run away. And do you know what I mean? You can make a perfectly good story. But for many types of interactive story, whether it's a, an adventure game where you can pick items up or a, I don't know, a dialogue based game where you've pissed a character off, you might want your game to know that you've made a particular decision, such as I have picked up a key or I have pissed off Jane, she's angry, because later scenes might need to know that information. So in our dungeon, we may have a door and the game will need to know whether or not you are carrying a key to the door, that kind of idea. Does that make sense? So those are the two bits that we're interested in. Those are the two bits that I'm going to teach you. How do we move between blocks? And how do we pick things up and do things and change the state of the game? And then how do we read that back in again? And with those two, you, it's like with those two weapons, you can make almost anything. It's absolutely ridiculous how much power those two things unlock. And to do them is quite easy. So the first thing is we want to offer the player, I don't know, two options. We'll give them one option just to keep it safe. So we're going to make a button. Making buttons is really easy. We need to do two things. We need to tell the player what the button is going to say, so what the text is that they click, and then we need to tell the game where it goes. Now, if you remember, you can click this button here to make a new passage. If I press it, it makes a new untitled passage, but it's not connected to anything, and it doesn't have anything written in it, and we don't need to do it this way because if we write things correctly here, it will, Twine will automatically make a new box for us. And the, a better flow to do it is to write things correctly and then things just get made. So the syntax for this, and this, if you've not written code before, follow this along exactly. And if you're stuck or it doesn't make sense, um, there's nothing wrong with just taking your hands off the keyboard and just watching. And then I'm going to send these so you can copy and paste them, or you can refer to them, or you can refer to this video as well. OK, so the syntax is, two square brackets. So for non-programmers, they're the ones next to your enter key. And then we want to write what the text says. So this is the bit that the player is going to see, and it can be anything. Um, in fact, I'm going to say there, for just for the player, there is a door to the east. So let's say, try the door, because later on, we're going to lock the door first. So at the moment, try the door. And then what we're going to need to write is a Pipe character. So on a, I'm on a Mac at the moment. So this, this is shift and then the button next to your enter key. I think Windows users, is it next to your left shift key, I want to say? Any Windows users chime in? So everybody got that? So on, on a PC 104 compliant uh, keyboard, which is essentially all of them these days, it should be to the right of your zero. The right of your zero. Okay, cool. So if you can find it, um, that's that's what you need. And it's a vertical pipe character. And then what we're going to do is we're going to write the name of a new scene that we're going to link this box to. So we're going to call it try the door. Now, one thing to watch out for. Also, I can't type when people are watching. Um, one thing to watch out for, don't put spaces in these things. It's a lot safer, I find, to just use a single um, load of characters like this. The capitalization doesn't matter um, as long as you're, you don't have spaces. If it's weird stuff happens. I don't know why. And then you can close it with another two square brackets. Now, you'll notice if you've done it correctly, and programmers, you'll know this stuff already. If you've done it correctly, you'll see that the color very slightly changes. And what it means is that Twine has gone, oh, I understand what this is. Now, the magic happens is when, when we close this, Twine goes, hey, 
I've seen that you're trying to make a new scene called Try the Door, but you haven't made, I haven't, haven't made a box. So Twine, when I exit this, will make one for us and link to it, which is really, really handy. And what it means is you can just type and you don't need to be clicking anything. You don't need to mess about with anything. You can just carry on going, okay? So just to clarify, so you can all see that, we've got a bit of text that the player sees, and then we're making a button that says Try the Door and it's linking to a scene called Try the Door, okay? And you could copy and paste this and make lots of buttons if you so wish. So in Try the Door, it's already got the right name. So when you do it like this, you won't need to rename anything. And the other thing that's useful is you can't do a typo on here because it's, it's filled out automatically. Okay, so oh, cheers. <laughs> Um, so we try in the door, and then at this point we can go, okay, well, as a writer, what do we want to, like, what's happening to the player? So for us, actually, at the moment, we just want to test that this one. So I'm going to write, you try the door. It opens. Hooray! Now let's just, let's test this. So you can see I've got my text up here. So we've just created the world's most boring video game. We're in a dungeon. There is a door. We're going to try the door. We press it and we finished the game. Hooray, this is possibly the simplest expression of gameplay I've ever made. You'll notice that Twine also gives you a back button. Now I'm somewhat of a purist and I like people to stick by their decisions. Um, you can put in, and I'll send you this as well, you can put in a little bit of um, CSS that will just turn this off. So it means that your adventure game, um, the player will choose something and they can't go back, they're stuck with that decision. And I, I think like, you want a bit of tension in your game, right? Well, maybe you don't, sometimes you can go back. So we've got our simple game. Um, but I think what we need to do now is we need to do something a bit more interesting. So why don't we lock the door and hide a key somewhere? Because what we want to do is learn how to tell Twine how to, how to tell the player they, they're not holding a key first, and then let the player pick a key up and open the door. So the first thing we're going to do is lock the door. Um, Dan, Katie's got a question. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I haven't got the chat open. Um, oh, hang on. No, she's got a oh, live. Yeah, sorry, oh, I just literally just put my oh, hand, up in the hand up. Oh, fire away. Yeah, interrupt. Hello, oh, sorry. Yeah. I just um, uh, I just pressed play on. I, I think I pretty much copied what you did, but I just pressed play and I, it said an error occurred while publishing your story. Hmm. I square bracket bracket e dot name square bracket finally is not a function. I don't. Uh, know is it that you that? use the word finally as a as a name somewhere? Maybe it might be a keyword that. I mean, I literally wrote what you wrote. <laughs> oh, strange. Okay. Um, do you want to put a pin in it for now and just follow, like, just watch, and I'll I'll grab. Yeah, no, no worries. I just wondered if it was anything yeah. that looked like I'm... something. That you <laughs> I'm sure that if I look at it for a couple of seconds, I'll spot it. Um, no but yeah, I can pick it up afterwards if that's okay. That's fine. Brill, right. Okay, so we have got, um, we're going to lock the door because what I want to do is, I, we, the first thing we want to do, so we, when, we, when you write interactive fiction, I find the best thing to do is build it up in layers. So before we start tangling with any clever stuff, we'll just make sure that the player can't progress past the door. So it's locked. Now, the first thing we want to do is, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a variable called has key. And it's basically us telling the game whether or not I'm carrying a key. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is at the very bottom of this opening scene, this is where you're going to set up these kind of, the, what I, I call like programmers will know the word variable and a variable is essentially a piece of information that your game or your program knows about. It could be true or false. It could be a number. It could be a name. It could be a piece of information. At the moment, we just want a true or a false. I'm either carrying a key to open the door or I'm not. But at the moment, I'm not because we've just started the game. So what we're going to do is we're going to tell the we're going to tell the game I'm not carrying the key explicitly because it might be that you replay the game. So when we restart it, I, I don't want to be carrying the key because I'd be cheating otherwise. So what we can do is we do slightly different here. We do a, a normal bracket and we're going to set. Um, in fact, I might just show you on mine just so you've got a reference for it. Um, in fact, yeah, let's have a look. So can you see here? So just to clarify, so I'm, um, this is the finished example, just so you've got an idea. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do set and then a dollar sign and then the name of our variable. So this, this part has key, can be anything. This could be spoken to Dave. This could be taken damage. It could be seen a werewolf, anything you want. And like these, this is just, it's, this is for your purposes only. The player doesn't see it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set this variable to false. Okay. Yep, Anne, fire away. Um, yeah, how do you, uh, I'm maybe jumping ahead a little, but I'm, I'm uh, wondering 
is there a way to make a block so I can do more than one action in the NIF? Yes. Like, so you, we can. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do if and else conditionals and things as the next step. Is that oh, oh, okay? I yeah. I was I was trying to do like like uh, more than one thing in an action. Um, okay. Right. So um, rem remember that I will come back to it and I'll show you how to make blocks and things as well. So for now, I'm just going to just because I'm lazy, I'm going to copy this. Um, so what you want to do is, so this is really, really handy because um, your, this stuff is invisible. Hang on, I'll open the wrong one now. Da, da, da. What did I call mine? My cool adventure. Here we go. So what you want is um, you're going to put it at the bottom. So this stuff is for you to control the state of the game, but the player doesn't see it. So the game knows that I'm, I've not got the key and that's all you need. So the player isn't gonna read it. And if I play this game, you'll see that it doesn't come up because this is part of you kind of programming the game. So it's, it's underneath here, but this is just setting the state in the game, okay? So the reason we do it here is that we, if we don't do it here, that it's neither true or false, it isn't defined. And that's a problem. So we want the game to know that I've specifically not got the key. This is kind of like, and you could set up 10, 15 different things depending on how you make your game. Um, it, this might be related to how you speak to characters or what you're holding or what you are doing, that kind of thing. And um, so it's, better, it's a much better practice to explicitly tell the game I'm not carrying the key because it's telling the game that later on, I might be able to pick up the key, but I don't currently have it, okay? So um, the next thing we're gonna do is, at the moment, we're gonna, we wanna tell the game that we're gonna try, so the reason I've called it try the door is that one of two things is gonna happen here. I'm either holding the key, in which case the door will open, or currently, because I haven't, I haven't made anything that lets the player pick the key up, I'm actually not carrying the key and the game is gonna say, oh, um, the, door isn't, the door is locked, you need to find the key, okay? And again, this is very, very oversimplified. So what we wanna do is we can do, um, I think it's if, and then a colon, and then the name of our variable, which was uh, has key. And you'll see if you've done it correctly, the colors change and that's twine signaling to you that you've done it correctly. You know, if I make a mistake or I forget the colon or whatever, it stays gray. So you need that. And it's telling you that I, it understands. So this, the flow is gonna be, and programmers, you will understand this. If you've not programmed before, if I say it in words, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna say, if you're carrying the key, display some text that says, hey, you've got the key, you can open the door. And if not, then tell the player the door is locked. And that's what we're gonna write. So we say, if has the key is true. So that's our, we're, te we're testing to see if that's true, whether or not I'm, I'm carrying it. Then we can make some square brackets and then we can put some text inside here that's gonna display to the player if that's true, okay? So you open the door with the key. Hooray. And then underneath, we can write else. And then we can put that in the brackets, OK? So what you're really doing, what you're essentially doing is you're saying to Twine, the player needs to see one of these two bits of text. If they've not got the key, or if they have got the key, we're going to show them that they can open it. And if they haven't, then we can't open it, OK? And we'll test that. And again, the, the one thing to always look out for is the color changes. So if you've missed a bracket or if you've missed a colon or whatever, it will still look gray. Bright colors means typically it works. And if we play this now, we haven't got any way to pick up the key. So the key is false. So we try the door. You try the door, it's locked. Oh, no. So now we need a way to pick up the key. So this is a video game. So we're going to make a little puzzle. We're going to hide the key in the room. Now, just for the purposes of demonstration, we're going to add a really obvious hiding place for the key. You can do what you like. Um, I am going to add some text here. And I quite like this flow because we've added a bit of text. We're telling the player, oh, you're in a room. There's a door. Now we want to tell the player a little bit more. So you can add a bit of text. So the first part, before you touch any code, is about you as a writer going, okay, well, what is the next part I need to write in order for the player to have a cool experience? So we're going to hide the key. We put, because this is a demo, we're not going to hide it very well. There is a door to the east that is also a suspiciously out of place plant pot in the corner of the room. We want the player to look at so what we can then do is rather than like, there's nothing wrong with copy and pasting. We want another button. So we, we're going to let them try the door, whether or not they're holding the key, but we also wanted to look at the plant pot. Okay. And again, this is a ridiculous demo scenario. So I'm going to just copy that line, put it underneath. 
And we're going to say, I don't know, examine the plant box. And then what we could write is, I don't know, plant pot. And again, because I've written this, if I exit this, we've already, it's already made a scene for us. So we've now got two possible things we can do from the starting thing. Is that making sense? And then here, we're going to write, you pick up the plant pot. There's a key underneath. OMG. And then what we need to do is we need to tell the game you've got the key, okay? Now we could type this, but what we're gonna do is at the moment, so at the start of the game, we set it to false, but now because we've hit this scene where you've picked it up, we can set it to true, you've picked it up, done, okay? So we can paste that in and I'm just gonna stick it underneath. So we're gonna set has key to true. Now the problem is at the moment, this is a dead end because we haven't given the player, when you go to, so if we just play it, and you, you'll do this quite often. You'll hit a dead end and you'll need to write some more to link the story up. So, hey, we're in a dungeon room. We're going to examine the plant pot. We pick up the plant pot. There's a key underneath. Great. But the problem is we need to do something with it. So for, just to keep things quick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to link to that one and say, why don't you now try the door? Because we just want the player to try it, okay? Just for completeness. So we're going to go back into this and we can say, why not? And then... Last time round, so in the first one, we had the whole line is clickable, but you can make inline links the same as on the web. So you can do exactly what you did last time, but you can do it as part of a sentence. So you could say, why not try the door? And then try the door. Okay. So uh, what we've got now is we start our game. And if we try the door without picking the key up, it knows. Okay, and we can go back in this instance, or it says, examine the plant pot. We picked up the plant pot. There is a queue underneath, hooray, why not try the door? And that links to the door scene now, rather than you going back. So part of your task as a writer of interactive fiction is going, okay, well, maybe I don't want to show them the first scene again. I just want to go, you know, you're standing, you're standing in the room. I just want to go straight to the door. And that's what we're doing here. Why not try the door? And then that scene again, now knows that we're carrying the key and goes, hey, we've opened up the door. Hooray, how exciting. So congratulations, we've made the world's simplest possible. This is the simplest possible expression of games. So um, this, so this kind of thing is like those, those two things alone will get you quite far. Um, but some stuff to think about, and I'm gonna send, um, send a load of examples afterwards, is that like, for example, we've got a simple true or false about your key, but imagine you wanted to add a monster to your dungeon and you have to hit it three times. What you could have is, you could have a thing here that says, I don't know, say you had a monster in the room and you needed to hit it three times, you would say monster punches to zero because you haven't punched it yet. And it might be that you have a scenario where after a few punches, the monster falls over and you can say, if it's equal to one, blah, blah, blah. Or it might be that you're, um, at the start, the game asks you to enter your name and it's, it might be that player name is equal to Dan, that sort of thing. So you can build up quite, quite complex things with quite simple bits of information. Um, yeah, question there? Yeah. Um, so, sorry to keep asking questions. No, not at all. Um, uh, so uh, would you go back to um, plant pot for a moment? Yes, of course. So there. Mm. Okay, so you did make it, uh, them have a user action to, to do the other um, thing. Well, the main reason we put the user action is just so they've got somewhere to go. So as soon as you hit this scene, we set the twine sets that variable. I put it at the bottom mainly just as convention. You can put it anywhere. And then um, when they click that, that variable is already true, so they can go back, if that makes sense. But you can do kind of all sorts of, um, you can do branching blocks and that sort of thing. So it might be that you, you can do things, for example, like picking random numbers. So you may have a game where a character rolls a dice and six different things could happen. Um, you could flip a coin. Um, I did one, uh, I did a demo story where you enter a room and there's a 50-50 chance that something will cut your head off and a 50-50 chance that you'll win the game, which is a bit unfair, really. Um, so really, Twine tries to kind of echo a lot of really simple structures code-wise and allows non-coders to kind of quickly do this stuff. Um, I'm so thinking about transition type things mm -hmm. for example 
when you pick up the key, it should, if you're going to make it glow blue and, and uh, uh, send you to wherever this other room sends you. Yeah, I mean, you could do that. So actually, um, you can do things like go to, there's a go to command, which will just immediately fire you to a different scene. So you could, for example, um, still trying to get do. <laughs> no, not at all. So you could do something like, I mean, really, the convention would be something like pick up the key, you know, like, yeah. like it's an action that you're picking up the key. So a lot of this is just about how you write things, really, like ultimately, whatever you do in this thing, it, it could be that you do, um, I don't know, pick up the key. And then that would be you'd link to a scene that gets I think what's important to note is that in this example, the scenes don't aren't rooms, they're, they're kind of actions for the player. And so it might be that you do pick up the key. And then it might be that you, I don't know, you think it's a trap. Ignore the key, smash the key, whatever. And but then there's no way to set as key to, key to true and then go to pick up the key. Um, you, you could, um, so personally speaking, I find it easier to make changes in scenes. So Twine for me makes sense when you modulize it. So each action is, is a kind of step or a block. Well, you, I mean, you can, you, I think you can do inline actions, but you end up almost coding in a single twine block, if that makes sense, where it, like, it kind of fights you in terms of offering lots and lots of options. I think you can do, think, you can do things like inline actions and then type, I think, but really twine works best when you kind of compartmentalize actions a little bit. So I, I, the way I would do it is pick up key or smash the key with your hammer, I don't know. And then yeah, I, I'm just the, trying to, scenes, I'm just trying to get things like the fact that I took this link is recorded without having a, 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 an explosion of states, just um, trying to remember state in, in that way yeah so there are so just so a, a better way of doing this would be for me to show you a more complex example so this is this was that would be lovely for you guys today so one thing you can do is you there's a twine will let you do really really clever stuff um it it tries to discourage you writing lots and lots of stuff in one single passage because the syntax is a bit gnarly i think however um i'm going to open the twine app which is a bit out of date on this machine but i was looking Looking at it earlier today. So I made a prototype of closed hands in Twine. So the actual game doesn't use Twine, it uses ink, which we'll be looking at on a Monday. And you can see here um, that some of these are quite complicated. And in fact, this illustrates quite well the different structures. So you can see a game that I made here, see you later, is actually a very linear piece of interactive fiction. It goes top to bottom um, and has like very, very tiny little branches. So you can see we still go start to finish. Um, but the one I was going to show you was this one here, closed hands, the prototype. And this is cool because this is a flow, pro it doesn't contain any text, it's just a flow prototype. So I could show other people what the scenes were and what leads to what. And this is a really, really useful way of using Twine that's not necessarily to make the game, but it's to express the structure of the narrative. So you can see here, um, I've got an entry point here that clearly leads to lots of places because you can see the arrows pointing all over the place. And in this instance, each of these horizontal flows is a different character. And if I play this, you can see that I am just going to make this a bit smaller. So what happens is um, when you play this, you select one of those characters and then that will put you on a flow for a particular character. Now, the reason this is cool is, and the reason I want to show it you is, we're also going to float an extra scene. So this thing on the right hand side is actually a twine scene that we're inlining and it monitors the state of the game because I wanted non-programmers to remember or have a reference for what a character did. So if I click through a few things, you can see that as I click, if you look on the right-hand side, it's remembering what I've done per scene. And this is a really, really useful tool for me because I worked with two of the programmers on this, uh, two of the writers on this project, neither of whom were programmers, but they still needed a way of going, oh, what did I choose 10 scenes ago? Because that's gonna matter in this scene, okay? So I can keep doing this and we get kind of this whole thing. And you can see that this is just me literally talking to other readers saying, this will be a critical scene in which blah, blah, blah. I haven't written it, I'm just planning it. And this is so, so useful. I do this constantly. So if we look at the Twine file for this, you can see there's, um, I'm gonna zoom in, just way, zoom in a little bit. So the app is a bit chunky, and you can see we've got all of our titles. 
Now I've got one called start here, but I've got variable display here, which is just a block that's not connected to anything. And this is, um, it just prints all of my variables. And so it kind of checks the state constantly and prints them to the log. And what happens is if I then go into one of these scenes, uh, where are we? Um, okay. Oh, there we go. So somewhere in here, it lets you see them. Uh, what does it just do at the start, maybe? It's been some years since I've looked at this, probably a couple of years old, this thing, um, wherever it is. But yeah, so the idea is that like this box floats over the top. and there's, So there's different ways of kind of maintaining state and working through flows and that sort of thing. Um, I think this has got, let's have a little look. Let's see, David. Oh yeah, there you go. So any box that's got this in, so I'm basically displaying variable display over the top. And so you can make layers in Twine if you want. So a really common use case would be if you're making an adventure game and it's got an inventory and we need to know what the player is carrying, we can do that sort of thing. In terms of flow, um, I, again, everything that I've made in Twine has this kind of very compartmentalized flow on purpose. You can do, so for example, um, You can do nested kind of if else blocks and that sort of thing. But if you look, they get very, um, they start to look like code and that's kind of fine. Um, one thing that might be of use to you, Anne, if you're more comfortable writing code code that looks like actual code, is there are other flavors of the Twine language that are slightly more akin to JavaScript and that might be a better way of doing it. So you can, they, like they implement stuff like switch statements and that kind of thing. So if you're happier, with going, oh, I'd like all of my logic to happen here, and then this seems to do one thing and lead to somewhere. That might no, be no. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with Harlow. <laughs> I, my only problem is, is like I say, um, I really wish I could do more than more than one thing in the action of an if. I, I wish I had a block. Um, or, or I think you can do. So what would you want to, so like with extra actions inside the block maybe, or? Um, uh, which probably is set a variable followed by going somewhere. Um, yeah, I think you probably could. I mean, you could, but it's just structurally makes, for, for me, makes less sense than um, break. Just, I, I think I just naturally break these things up. And so I, I would, I, in my head, I go, oh, well, this is my block that is, picks up the key. And then I do all of the work to set it up. Because what you can then do is, um, let's we try it. We'll give it a whirl. Yeah, I, I'm trying to, I, I, one thing I hate about interactive fiction is, is the, the one button press gives you, um, gives you one sentence stories. Yeah, yeah. Because, because those end up, you end up feeling like a pigeon. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so it's, it's interesting you note this actually. So one, th I think one of the drawbacks of, with Twine in particular, when engines like Twine, is that they enforce that a particular play style. Unless some people work very, very hard to make it not behave like that, Twine is intrinsically a stage-based form of interactive fiction. Now, the thing that we're going to cover on Monday is Ink. Now, Ink is a lot more close to code, and there's a lot more. Um, it flows a lot less linearly, if that makes sense. So for example, and I'm, I can't dig into it too much. I haven't got anything on this machine actually, but ink will do. So for example, let me see if I can find it. Um, so this kind of display here, although I'm using ink here to do a binary choice, you can do really clever stuff with ink, like cascade into lots of different choices, depending on what variables are. So for example, it will let you inline things. It will let you join scenes together. So they, they merge into each other. Um, and you can, you can just see here, actually, um, there's no, no real scenes in ink. They are, they're just appended to a big list and it becomes a piece of kind of long form fiction, depending on how you write it. So ink is, um, although obviously we'll get into it properly on Monday if you're in that session, um, is a much more flexible way of telling interactive stories that maybe don't adhere to you do a thing, you do another thing, you do another thing forever, if that makes sense. So I think like my use of, of ink is a little bit of a reaction to that in the sense that I wanna do cleverer things with narrative that maybe wanna break out of that structure. So I think, I have, I, and I'll set a few examples, I have seen people do quite a lot of really, really clever stuff with Twine. 
but you do have to fight it a lot. And I think if you end up making something that complex, you're really into coding a game at this point, rather than like, I think Twine suits a particular kind of a IF and does it really well, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I think some of the really complex stuff will probably look horrible under the hood because you probably can twist it into new forms, but it's a lot of work. Um, right, okay, so um, is that making sense for people? Is there any other, um, Louise, you've got a question there. Sorry, you've had your virtual hand up for ages. Um, yeah, it's okay. It's just that um, Renee's got a question in the oh, yeah. which is quite a good one. Hang on, out. so let's have a look. Um, is it in the chat? Yeah. You should be able to see it. Is it possible to make a oh, yeah. twine? Uh, is it possible? Um, is it possible to make up? So you're essentially, are you asking about multiplayer twine games, maybe? Um, so I. Hi, um, sorry, it's not Renee, it's actually Renee's wife, Lila. Hello. Um, sorry, I'm. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Renee's wife. But, um, yeah, um, yeah, what I was asking, yeah, what I was asking about um, is whether it's possible to have this and almost have two people using it at the same time. So we've kind of got them playing different characters, um, but the decisions that one of them makes then affects the choices that, that the next one sees in, in the next block. Do you mm. see what I mean? Is so. That there were two readings to that. So if you wanted to make a game where the players were taking turn on the same machine, I've seen, I've seen games work with that with multiple players where you're doing different actions. You could probably do it that way. If you mean a live multiplayer game where you're both, you both join the game, is that, is that kind of more what you're getting at? Yeah. yeah. So I think um, Twine is not the tool that you would use for that kind of thing. And the main reason is that multiplayer stuff requires a whole bunch of extra functionality and a lot of infrastructure so you need a server you need them to talk to each other connect pass messages um, multiplayer games are just intrinsically more difficult to make and so you can you can quite easily make um shared text-based spaces to my knowledge and i might be wrong on this i will check um i think you would have to contort twine into fairly hideous shapes in order to make a multiplayer version of it if that makes sense yeah, yeah, it does, yeah. But if your intention was to make a multiplayer text-based space, for example, that's the kind of thing that a web programmer could use WebSockets or whatever and make it quite quickly. And I've, I've developed multiplayer infrastructure for people like the BBC, which enabled multiplayer games and message passing and that sort of thing. But there's just, there's, it's just a whole level above running some text on your machine. There's like a whole bit of engineering that is needed to, to connect those two things. Yeah, that. that makes sense. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting one, though. So if you wanted to make something that is multiple people sat around the same game, and, can, you know, it would be quite a, quite a strange one, but it'd be quite, in, quite an interesting dynamic of you'd have a variable saying um, player, one to, player one's turn or player two's turn, and it would switch and, to, and display different things depending on whose, whose turn it is. And that'd be quite an interesting thing to do. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anything about coding at, at, at all, but um, well, I mean, I've said, you know, my um, my son's played sort of chess on, on online and that's something that they can seem to make sort of take turns like like that. But um, yeah, no, it, it just struck me it would be quite cool if you could do it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, you want a mud? Um, any other questions? Sorry. You want a mud? Yes. Yeah. Like, that's that's essentially what you're getting at. So that's, that's what you're looking for. If anyone's ever played a mud before, a uh, multi-user dungeon, which is quite literally what it says on the tin, uh, multiplayer um, kind of spaces where text is kind of exchanged, and they're always, always quite interesting. I've fallen into a few role-play servers of action games and adventure games um, where people role-play and play characters and things. I also I imagine most people sitting in their computers dressed as wizards and things. Um, but the less said about that, the better, I say. Um, any other questions from folk um, while we're here? Uh, yeah. Hiya. Um, how do I now save this? I, so Ooh. I can. I want, I've, I've done it on a different machine, but now I need to explore. That's a great question, and I'm terribly glad you asked. That I was remiss and have forgotten. I talked about it at the start, and I didn't fill you in. So please stand by. I'm going to share my screen. That is. A, I'm so glad you asked. So uh, the way to share and um, disseminate things in Twine is actually quite easy. So um, at the moment, your game exists in Twine. It's sat in the browser. But the way you give out a Twine game is that it spits out a single HTML file that contains all of the JavaScript and your entire great game. And it, it contains everything that's, need, everything that's needed to run the game. And the reason this is so good is that it works everywhere. So you can just give this to people, or you can dump it onto a web server. So all you need to do is you hit 
your this arrow button that's next to the name of your game and hit publish to file and it will bring up a browser window um, a file browser window so i'm going to stick mine on my desktop and it, it um, has the name that you've put in as the title and if i hit save what it'll do is um, you can probably see here uh, oh, when it's quite finished there we go uh, so i've now got mycooladventure.html and when i double click it it will just run and it contains all of your text, everything else. And that's that's all the plays when you hit that play button. But what it means is the person you send this to doesn't need any particular things. So this has actually got, um, in fact, should we have a little look inside just for the code heads? Um, I was thinking, not opened at them in about 500 years, but let's see how this goes. Um, but yeah, so all of the JavaScript and everything else is there. And it just means that they're very, very portable and they just work. Um, but yeah, so the actual file itself is quite complex. Um, but again, if you're not a, is it going to work? Who knows? This might, it might be quite big actually. Yeah. So it's like, it's minimized and inlined and you can see it just contains tons and tons of stuff. Um, but your game is, you can, oh, in fact, actually you can see my game text there and then it's got loads and loads of JavaScript. So. Uh, for non-technical people, all you need to know is that's all it spits out. And then you can upload that to a server. You can stick it anywhere you like and people will be able to play it. The other half to that is how do I load it back in? So for example, if I've changed my browser and I want to carry on working on my game, you might keep it in Dropbox or whatever. What you can do is um, if you go hit the home button and go back to the menu, you can do import from file and there's no extra file. It's just that HTML file and you can bring it back in and it will understand. So it won't let me do this because I've already got my full adventure. But if you have something with a different name, you can just bring it back in. So that's really handy. So I tend to use Twine for prototypes and um, for game jams and hack days and planning and all sorts of other things. And the part of the reason for that is that saving it out and giving it to somebody else and letting people play it is like one click and I can drag it somewhere and it just works. Um, compared to um, Ink, for example, that we're going to talk about on Monday is super powerful, really flexible, and it's brilliant, especially for writing, but it's a little bit more difficult to share um, kind of customized versions and things, if that makes sense. But we will dig into that on Monday. Um, cool. I'm really glad you asked about that. I completely forgot. 